What's up, everybody? Thanks for clicking this video. Thanks for tuning into my channel. My name's Simon Hill, Black American from Louisiana, coming to you live this Friday evening in Budapest, Hungary. Today is April 5th, 2024. This year is flying by fast. Been working hard on so many other projects. Just completed the E40 list. Go check out that on Culturalist Theory dropping soon. Backpack Bandits just dropped some new content. Go check out the new video we released on Backpack Bandits today of us going to Diani Beach. And uh, also go check Check out the new movie review my wife and I did for the 2023 musical version of Color Purple. We have a new movie review drop dropping later tonight. We're going to hop on X later tonight after this live stream to review this long-ass Turkish film called About Dry Grasses. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. Today we're going to be talking about something a bit more serious. Uh, as you see from the title of this live stream. And trust me, people, I'm going to try to go live as often as I can to do more topics and cover more ground. But Craig Mack called me fat a few days ago. So I've been in the gym going crazy, trying to get slim fit for the summer. You know what I mean? I'm trying to make sure I can still slide into a pair of 34 jeans. So uh, you know, I don't want anybody ever coming up on my channel saying Simon is a big boy because of the belly. No, I'm a big boy because I'm a big dog. I'm a beast outside, but not because I'm fat. So I've been outside trying to work out and trying to keep it straight. That's why I ain't been going live as much. And also I'm writing, teaching, all sorts of stuff here in Budapest. But thank you for everybody who's been subscribing. I just passed 3,000 subscribers on this channel. A lot of that has to do with the travel content. If you're a subscriber because of the travel content I've done, I'm sorry, but I won't be traveling for some time. I'm living here in Budapest. I'll be studying here in Budapest in a few months. And on top of that, I'll be working here in Budapest as an English teacher for the next few years, as far as I can see. So there won't be any new travel content, but expect a lot of movie reviews, maybe album reviews coming up, and of course, live streams like this where I cover deep and interesting topics from the Black perspective on different parts of the world. So stay tuned for that. Anyway, for today's live stream, we're going to be talking about Africa and Ethiopia because I am sick and tired of hearing about Black people getting on the internet and talking about Gaza the Middle East, Palestine, Israel versus Palestine. Is it a genocide? Is it not? I think anybody with two eyes and a heart and a brain can realize what is happening to the Palestinian people is a tragedy. And it is genocide. And Israel is completely unhinged. And what they are doing is absolutely wrong. But I am sick and tired of seeing black people throw their lives away, throw their careers away, throw their opportunities away to vouch and advocate for a people that literally still call us slaves. We had a black woman this year, the first black woman to be the president of Harvard, lose her job fighting over these dusty, musty, nasty Arabs who if she were happen if she were to go to Jordan or Morocco or Tunisia or Libya, they would literally call her a prostitute because that's how the Arabs view black women. They view them as prostitutes, sex workers, and slaves. They still call black people slaves in the Arab world. And yet and still we have black people still to this day protesting, marching, getting beat up, going to jail rioting, losing their jobs, losing their careers over a, a group of people who literally do not care two shits about us. Is this the right way to move forward? I think not. I think not. I heard Professor Black Truth say this a few days ago, and I found this to be absolutely en enlightening. The Gazan people will be fine. One day, all of this will be behind them, and they will get their land back. They will get their territory back. There will be justice for the Palestinian people. Because the whole world is rallying behind them. Everybody, the whole world, most of the most of the sensible, rational world, who is not the you know handful of leaders in the Western European nations, most of the world is rallied behind the Palestinian people, and they know what is happening to them as a tragedy, and they will do whatever they can to get justice for them, and there will be some justice for the Palestinians. I cannot see a future where Israel just walks away from what they're doing to uh, the Gazan people uh, scot-free as if everything just goes back to normal. They can't just commit mass extinction, uh, settler colonialism in the modern day and just get away with it. That won't happen. That won't happen, okay? The gods and people will be fine, so we don't need to throw our lives away about it. It will work out in their favor. The whole world is behind them. But what about us? What about us? If anybody can find me a single YouTube channel where there is an Arab person, a Turkish person, a non-Black person who has dedicated their life to talking about anti-Black racism, white supremacy, and the fight to abolish it, and they are willing to lose their job, their careers, their opportunities speaking up for us, I will delete my entire channel. And don't bring up Tim Wise. I don't want to hear anybody bring up Tim Wise or any other one or two white folks and no Sean King. Sean King is not allowed. We know that's a white man, but we've probably traded him in by now. We let <laughs> we traded in Sean King for uh, Iggy Azalea. I don't know. 
<laughs> we let the whites get Eminem and we took Sean King. I don't know if that's a good trade or not. <laughs> but either way, either way, the point I'm trying to make is I'm, I'm sick and tired of hearing black people come up and talk about this foreign issue. But we have so many stories in the black world that need to be discussed. For example, what is happening in the Sudan, which I've been covering sporadically on my channel, how there are Arabs in Sudan to this day exterminating an entire ethnic group, an entire tribe of black people. What are we going to do about that? Why is nobody speaking about that? We have so many black people willing to go out into the streets and get beat up and go to jail and die over a group of people who would spit in their face and call them black slaves and prostitutes. Do, is that really who we're fighting for? I'm telling you right now, I don't care how many of those Gazans die. I don't care how many of their children have to go to a grave because I know for a fact black Arabs, Arab society is built around anti-blackness. And until they change their culture, God will continue to inflict punishment upon them. I said this in my very first live stream about Israel and Palestine. I do not care how many of their children have to get buried under Israeli bombs sent by U.S. tax dollars. Nothing will change for them until God sees that they have changed their hearts and minds on how they treat the other Afro-Palestinians, the other Afro-Jordanians, Afro-Syrians, Afro-Saudis, Afro-Moroccans, etc., etc. So Nelson Moreno jumped into the comments. He said, we good. Simon, please cover the Lamar and Cole songs. Yeah, and Sudan. Uh, too much Ukraine talk, too. Absolutely, Rodman. Too many people talking about Ukraine, Gaza, all this sort of stuff. But nobody's talking about what's happening in Ethiopia. Uh, Nelson Moreno asked me to talk about the uh, Jake Cole and Kendrick stuff. Real quick, I'm just going to give my two cents on this because I love hip hop just like anybody else. My opinion is this. Kendrick dropped that verse really because he has been a clout chaser. When you look at the history of Kendrick and J. Cole's beef, it's very somewhat one-sided. And in my opinion, Kendrick ever since Drake sort of gave him the opportunity to shine on the Take Care album on that song, uh, Oh, God, the solo song that he had on the Take Care album. I forgot, but it's one of my favorite songs on uh, in Drake's catalog. Uh, Dr Kendrick, since then, has been nitpicking at Drake, like throwing subliminal shots at Drake. And it really came to a head with the control verse. And if anybody remembers, there's this rumor and story that Kendrick and Drake went on ESPN, some talk show, and then they started ye ye uh, ye yelling at each other, attack attacking each other, shouting at each other. But they deleted the footage because nobody uh, wanted to see both of their careers implode because they really had have had beats since then. I would say this. I think at that you know, Sports Center, ESPN, video, whatever. That was Kendrick going off on Drake for whatever reason, because I believe deep down in my soul, Kendrick is jealous of the type of attention that Drake gets from his music, right? And uh, yeah, I think J. Cole jumping out and attacking Drake, I mean, attacking Kendrick with this uh, seven minute drill song that he dropped today. I think this is Drake buying some time because Cole and Kendrick are on, Cole and Jake, no, Cole and Drake are on tour together right now, right? And so, you know, Drake is probably focused on the show and he is probably talking to his handlers, his managers, his Illuminati bosses about what's the best way to reply to Kendrick. You get what I'm saying? Uh, Nelson Moreno said, buried alive interlude. Facts, yes, buried alive. Yeah, that was a that was a hot song from Take, uh, Take Care. My opinion is that Drake is like talking to his Illuminati bosses on whether he can or cannot respond to Kendrick because Drake is a brand. Drake is Sprite. You feel me? Like Drake is a multinational incorporation. <laughs> Kendrick is still that is still K dot from Compton, and and J Cole is a little bit more established and popular than Kendrick. I would say a little bit, but not by much, and it alternates sometimes. Depends on who's more active outside. You feel me? Uh, but. I think J. Cole is the soldier standing up for his homie Drake because Drake is on the road with J. Cole. They're getting money together. So then they're going to be like, OK, how what's the best way for us to go at this? Because in my opinion, on the like that verse, Kendrick didn't say anything about J. Cole at all. There were no shots at J. Cole. But J. Cole is riding with his boy Drake because Drake is like giving him props on stage every night on every tour they do and stuff like that. And so, you know, J. Cole is like, OK, Drake, I got this. You feel me? And I'm, I'm very interested to see if Kendrick is able to take on J. Cole and Drake. Now, I don't think I'm, I'm going to keep it real with you. Y'all might y'all might disagree with me on this. And I want y'all to tell me what you think. In my opinion, I think Drake right now could wash Kendrick. I think Drake could wash Kendrick because after what Pusha D, after what Pusha T did to Drake, there's nothing that can harm this man, in my opinion. In my opinion, Drake is bulletproof now. Because we know about the kid. 
We know about the porn star baby mama. We know about him trying to reveal his kid through an Adidas ad line. You know, we know Drake is weird. He's put hot sauce in condoms, all that sort of stuff. All of Drake's business is out there. You get what I'm saying? That's my opinion. We don't know who Kung Fu Kenny is. Is this nigga Jesus Christ? Is he a Hebrew Israelite? Is he a Muslim? Is he a Compton Crip? Is he a gangbanger? Like, did he really catch a body? <laughs> is he a robot? <laughs> is he really five foot two? <laughs> like, who is Kendrick Lamar? I feel like Drake could really expose this man and J. Cole could expose this man even more. Now, I don't think they actually want to go that far because when we listen to the seven minute drill freestyle that J. Cole dropped, J. Cole is still like, you're my brother. I love you. But I'm just I feel like J. Cole will attack it like rapping. And Kendrick probably looks at this like rapping. But Drake, because he's very, very emotional, very passive aggressive and very serious. I feel like Drake will attack this very, very seriously. Because I believe Drake is like overboard with it. Like Drake has Drake is at the top because he's been going overboard with hip hop, in my opinion. But I want to know what y'all think. Uh, so uh, Nelson Moreno says they're all narcissists. Facts. I think Drake is the biggest narcissist, but I think Kendrick is the second biggest narcissist in the group. And then J. Cole is the third biggest narcissist. Uh, Rodman says they all try to sell records with drama. Don't fall for it. I, I think that too, obviously, like it's hip hop and it's entertainment. And listen, I don't think there's anything wrong with, you know, doing drama in hip hop just to sell records. Right. It's a business. Everybody loves confrontation. So it's just it's just a part of the game. Right. And you can choose whether to buy into it or not. But one of my favorite 50 cent records is your life's on the line. And that's a big Ja Rule diss song. All he is is dissing Ja Rule on that. So, I mean, hip hop, what makes it special from the other art forms like country, like uh, pop music, is that there is that competitive spirit between the artists. You know, I mean, Taylor Swift and Katy Perry went at it, but nobody cares. Nobody cares. Nobody's still talking about Taylor Swift and Katy Perry in 2024. We are still talking about Jay-Z versus Nas in 2024. We're still talking about Tupac and Biggie. And depending on where Kendrick, J. Cole, and Drake goes, this could be the biggest hip hop battle of all time. Low key. We've never seen anything like this. If all three of them start going at it, that would be insane. That would be insane. Um, all right. Uh, Nelson Moreno says, uh, what see from Drake is a copy from another copy without an original image. I mean, there is some truth to that. Listen, my biggest gripe with Drake is that he is a pop star, right? He literally made a song called Pop Star, right? Uh, but I don't think Drake's pen is something to be messed with. Yes, he does have ghostwriters. And yes, a lot of Drake songs are meant to just be mindless, you know, radio music. But his pen is not to be played around with. Go listen to For All the Dogs, the extended version with those extra like four or five songs. He is spitting, spitting. He's going crazy. And I really think if Drake drops a duppy freestyle on Kendrick, it might be over. Because Kendrick could really show us the emperor has no clothes. Everybody's talking like Kendrick is this lyrical beast and all that sort of stuff. He's the motor mouth. He's the motor mouth kid. Let's keep it a buck. But like that verse was not that hard. I'm going to keep it a buck. Am I tripping? Am I tripping outside? I, am I tripping? The like that verse was not that hard. <laughs> he wasn't going crazy. <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> Come on, man. Anyway, uh, Nelson Moreno says impossible. Maybe he thinks it's impossible for Drake to watch Kendrick. Backpack Bandits with what? His Ghost Riders team? Oh, okay. Acting throwing shots. Anything said on the Backpack Bandits side in this chat is not written for me, guys. That's from Acti. That's from Acti. It's not for me. Uh, I was in our other account. Th see, she re she revealed it. Uh, we don't know what God Kendrick worships. <laughs> exactly. Kendrick could be worshiping Satan for all we know. <laughs> we don't know what Kendrick will be doing. That's what I'm saying. I think, I really think J. Cole could, J. Cole and Drake could expose Kendrick and show us who, who this man really is. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. But either way, we can talk hip hop. If y'all want to continue talking about that, we can. But I really wanted to talk about this issue going on in Ethiopia right now. Uh, sorry, I went off track with the hip hop stuff. But let's go here. Let's go here. Because I'm tired of hearing people talk about Gaza. In Ethiopia, a secret committee orders killings and arrests to crush rebels. The shrouded bodies of elders from the Karayu tribe of Ethiopia, the men were killed by security forces in 2021, witnesses told Reuters. And this was written uh, in handout. So this was written by Julia Pavaricini, published on February 23rd, 2024. So warning, this story contains disturbing visual content. Secretive committees of senior 
senior officials in Ethiopia's largest and most populous region, Aromia, had, has ordered extrajudicial killings and illegal detentions to crush an insurgency there, a Reuters investigation has found. Reuters interviewed more than 30 federal and local officials, judges, lawyers, and victims of abuses by authorities. The agency also reviewed documents drafted by local po political and judicial authorities. These interviews and documents for the first time shed light on the workings of the Kori Naginya Security Committee in the Oromo language, which began operating in the months after Prime Minister Abi Ahmed came to power in 2018. The committee's existence has not been previously reported. Uh, I'm very disappointed to see all these videos and all these stories about these secret police uh, agencies that all these African nations have. Like, why do we have to always have these, you know, KGB type forces or Gestapo type forces arresting black people, killing black people in our own nations, right? In Africa. For anybody who doesn't know, this is Ethiopia right here in the heart of Africa. Some say the African nation that was not colonized. Why, why, why is there all this bloodshed of other black people in black lands? This should be against our code. We should all be on code. And the very first thing about being on code is that all black life is sacred. We should not be trying to take and hurt other black people, period. Continuing here. All right. Five current and former government officials told Reuters that the committee is at the heart of Abi's efforts to end a years old insurgency by the Oromo Liberation Army, OLA, OLA which wants self-determination for the Oromo people and greater language and cultural rights. Oromos have long complained of political and social marginalization. When new protests broke out in 2019, the government cracked down hard. The Kori Naginya took the lead, the five officials said. I heard something like in, in Ethiopia, their constitution allows their country to break up because Ethiopia is actually like a, a, con a conglomeration of many different ethnic groups and tribes and different people who speak different languages and have different religions and stuff like that. So their nation is actually a loose confederation of different nations, similar to like the United Kingdom, but way more diverse. And uh, what they're having here is a lot of ethnic division and tension in Ethiopia, where some of these regions want, you know, self self rule, they want independence, but the nation wants to keep it together because they are stronger together than they are separated. I think this is a good time to talk about Fresh and Fit. If anybody doesn't know who Fresh and Fit are, they're the two tethers who like to go online and bash women and talk bad about black women and also spread anti-black uh, talking points and also spit this red pill content. Recently, one of the guys of Fresh and Fit, I believe Fresh, the dark skin brother who's uh, Bahamian or something like that, uh, got exposed for having uh, an Asian baby mama who is now claiming she's pregnant and he doesn't want her to have an abortion. Meanwhile, Fit, the other guy, the light skin guy, I believe he's Ethiopian, if not Sudanese or something like that. Um, like their whole brand doesn't make sense. And the thing is this tribalism that we're seeing here in Ethiopia where the government is assassinating and killing their own people reminds me a lot of these fresh and fit guys. They're coming to our nation, they're coming to America and they're bringing their horrible culture, their anti-black, their, their anti-woman culture, their hateful culture for other black people and stuff like that. Nobody should be following fresh and fit because what they are doing is just importing their sort of negative view on life uh, to our people and we should not be following them at all. All right. Uh, Nelson Moreno says, I would keep the baby with that Chinese lady. I mean, she was bad, but it was basically 50% plastic. She's 50% plastic. She can barely put articles in her speech. Uh, you should not, men, I'm going to tell you guys this. If you're going to be a passport bro, if you're going to get a girl, make sure she understands indefinite articles. Don't be getting a girl say, I want keep baby. Don't, no, 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 no. We don't, we don't do that. You cannot come in anybody who says, I want to, I want to keep baby. <laughs> don't do that. Please don't do that. Uh, Nelson Moreno says he's from Sudan and he considers himself Arab. Even worse, even worse, because that's a black man. <laughs> Nobody would look at fit from Fresh and Fit and say that's an Arab. No, not at all. Not at all. He might say, you're ignorant, Simon. You're looking at a uh, race through a uh, uh, an American lens. No, nigga, I know a black person when I see one. And you are black, my nigga. You are blackity black. Uh, so, yeah, it's even worse that he would claim to be an Arab because he's putting a bad image on Arab people in America with these type of talking points that they say on Fresh and Fit. Sorry I'm ranting here, but it, it's hard for me not to see the parallels of this uh, murderous culture that they have in Ethiopia where they're slaughtering other people who look like them just because they have 
have uh, uh, different languages, different religions and that sort of stuff in Ethiopia and how the people that come from this region come to America and, and try to cause the same division among us. Sorry, I just have to bring this up. Uh, even, even if Fit is not from Ethiopia, still, it's very symbolic of that. Going to continue here. So the violence in Aromia has displaced hundreds of thousands of people. Ethiopia's government and human rights officials accused the OLA of killing scores of civilians since 2019, a charge the group denies. One of the five sources was willing to be identified. Milkesa Gemichu, a former member of the governing Prosperity Party Central Committee. The others, including two people who have attended meetings of the Kori Naginya, spoke on condition of anonymity. The people familiar with Kori Naginya's activities attributed dozens of killings to the committee's orders and hundreds of arrests. Among the, four, among the killings, they said, was a massacre of 14 shepherds in Aromia in 2021 that the government has previously blamed on OLA fighters. Interesting. Uh, horrible to hear this. It's sad to see Abi Ahmed, how his image has changed. I believe he came into office and people were saying that Abi Ahmed was like the leader who was going to bring peace to Ethiopia. I believe he actually was given a Nobel Peace Prize and now he's probably the president that has the most bloodshed on his hands. It seems like anytime a black leader gets the Nobel Peace Prize, it's almost like they're destined to go to war because the same thing happened to Barack Obama. He got elected. They gave him the Nobel Peace Prize. Next thing you know, he's doing drone strikes on children and women in Afghanistan. It's sad. It's sort of ironic. So uh, going here to uh, Nelson Moreno, he has brought Nazis on the show. Yeah. If you're palling around with uh, Nick Fuentes and, uh, you know, putting on clan hoods and throwing up white power signs in your live streams and you claim to be an Arab and you look black and you're spitting red pill talking points. Yeah. You, nobody should be following you, man. Nobody should be following you. So glad to see Fresh and Fit got demonetized. But uh, by the way, this channel is going, it will... Uh, it will permanently be under monetized, if that makes sense. Maybe even demonetized because I'd be giving up the real. But y'all don't hear me talk bad about black women. Y'all don't hear me talk bad about any other group of people except anti-black racists or societies who are anti-black racists. And though sometimes I can be harsh, like at the beginning of this live stream where I said, I don't care how many gods and children die as long as their societies are anti-black. You guys know that's not sincerely coming from my heart. But it's pointing out the hypocrisy of us caring about a group of people who do not care when our children die. Where were the Arabs? Where were the Turks? Where were the non-Black people of the world when Tamir Rice was shot in the back? Where, were, where are the people in the world who are, are non-Black when they're talking about the, the scores of Black men who are thrown in jail unjustly every year and murdered by our state every single year? Where are they? Where are they? Nobody's willing to throw their lives out on the line calling out America's racism and hypocrisy. But we are expected to throw our lives away speaking up for the Gazan people. Let's not do that. All right. So uh, continuing here with the story, Reuters presented its findings to the head of the state appointed Ethiopian Human Rights Commission, EHRC, Daniel Bekele. In an interview, Bekele confirmed the existence of the Kori Naginya. He said its aim was to address growing security challenges in Aromia, but it overreached its purpose by interfering, interfering in the justice system with widespread human rights violations. We documented multiple cases of extrajudicial killings, arbitrary detention, Tensions, torture, and extortion, Bekele said, without elaborating on specific incidences. Uh, incidents. Ethiopia's federal government, Prime Minister Abiy's office, and the Oromia regional government did not respond to detailed questions for this article. Abiy has previously defended his government's human rights record. On February 6th, he told Parliament during routine questions, since we think along democratic lines, it is hard for us to even arrest anyone, let alone execute them. The unrest in Oromia, home to Ethiopia, Ethiopia's capital, Addis Ababa, uh, is a reminder of continuing instability in the Horn of Africa nation, a patchwork of many ethnic groups. Ethiopia is scarred by conflict. A two-year civil war in the northernmost region, Tigray, killed hundreds of thousands of people until a peace deal was struck in November 2022. Fighting erupted last July in another northern region, Amhara, between the Ethiopian army and local militiamen. There, the federal government has imposed a state of emergency. Violence in Oromia has continued even even after the federal government and the OLA rebels held peace talks for the first time in early 2023. Ethiopia's government has 
uh, designated the OLA a terrorist organization, a label that the United States and the United Nations have not applied to the group. According to the current and former Ethiopian officials, the Kori Naginya meets in the Oromia regional offices of Abi's Prosperity Party and is headed by Abi's former chief of staff, Shimelis Abdisa, uh, the president of Oromia region. Uh, Shimil Shimalis and other committee members are ethnic Oromo. Fekadu Tesema, leader of the Prosperity Party in Oromia, sits on the committee, as does Arasa Merdessa, head of security for Aromia, and a half a dozen other local political and security officials, the sources said. None of these people responded to questions from Reuters. All right, so Reuters found no evidence that Abi attended the meetings or that he issued orders to the committee. People familiar with the matter said the committee was formed at Abi's instigation. Abi was briefed on at least one occasion in early 2022 about the committee's activities, said a person who was present. Reuters couldn't independently verify this. The security committee is little known beyond a tight official circle. Reuters found one reference to it in the public record, a paragraph in a 2021 report by the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission about abuses of the justice system. The EHRC report said the committee, known as the Yedehenetete Committee in Ethiopia's official language, Amharic, investigated and jailed people with suspected ties to armed groups instead of allowing the justice system to take its course. Uh, Jal Maru, the military leader of the OLA, told Reuters in an interview that he is aware of the Kori Naginya's existence and that high-ranking officials in Aromia are its members. He accused the committee of ordering extrajudicial judicial killings, arbitrary detentions, harassment, and intimidation without citing, a, without citing specific examples. So just to summarize, just to bring it all up, if I'm if I'm understanding this text correctly, basically in the region where the largest, where the largest city in Ethiopia is, Addis Ababa, there's basically like sort of like a civil war and insurgency fighting. And the uh, people in this region sort of want independence away from Ethiopia, which I find crazy because this region is the capital, where the capital is. And if I understand Ethiopia right from my understanding, and maybe they'll talk about this more in the um, in the article, I think the Oromo people are the largest ethnic group in Ethiopia, and they have an outsized influence in politics in the country. Now, forgive me if I'm wrong. I didn't look that up before, but I do believe the Oromo are the largest ethnic group in Ethiopia. And so many other groups of people like the Tigray and others, right? Uh, I think there's also a substantial Somali population in Ethiopia as well. They kind of want to break away because the Oromo dominate uh, politics in this nation so much. If I'm wrong, uh, help me out. Look it up in the chat. Ozzy, Nelson Moreno, tell me what are the demographics of Ethiopia so we can break this down for real. But I believe Abi Ak is of mixed uh, ethnic origin, but he does represent the Oromo people too. But I believe he has one parent from a different, different ethnic tribe and that sort of stuff. But I have to say this, none of this should matter because once again, you know, as black people, the one thing that we do own in this world are our nations, right? And what we should be looking at as at our our nations as is vehicles for black liberation and for vehicles to fight white supremacy. Uh, these should not be uh, nation states for certain ethnic groups or certain tribes or anything like that. We have to be unified as one, as a people. We cannot be looking at each other like you are Swahili, you are Somali, I'm American, you're Brazilian. We have to look at ourselves as one people. Until we get to that point, we'll constantly be fighting against the white supremacy of the white supremacists and ourselves. Uh, the, uh, groups like the uh, the secret police, the Kori Naginya, and uh, other secret police that other African nations uh, use or utilize to control their people, harass their people, uh, suppress their people, is not okay. It's not okay. How about we use the opportunity that we have with these nations to actually create a better society for people that look like us? All right. So Nelson Moreno says there's more than 90 ethnicities in Sudan. All right. We're not talking about Sudan, though. We're talking about Ethiopia. And I believe in Ethiopia, the Aromo are the largest amount. Acti just hopped into the chat. She said Aromo, approximately 34.4%. Amhara, approximately 27%. Somali, approximately 6.2%. Tigrayan, approximately 6.1%. Sidama, approximately 4%. All right, so in Ethiopia. Okay, exactly. So yeah, the Amhara and the Aromo are like the largest uh, ethnic groups here. And I think if I understand right, like what we think of as Ethiopian culture, I believe is mostly Amhara, right? Like when we think about uh, the foods and uh, the language, Amharic and stuff like that. And uh, 
yeah, we imagine Ethiopia as Amhara, but like the Oromo probably have their own separate culture, their own separate food, their own, of course, their own separate language, right? So there's probably in Ethiopia this sort of tension between these two groups. But I'm just saying, and this might sound simplistic for me, but we should be putting our weapons aside against each other and facing these weapons towards the white supremacists and the globalists who try to uh, uh, subjugate Africa and keep us permanently dispossessed and oppressed. All right. But uh, yeah, we should be talking about this more than Gaza because this Africa in itself is a testing ground for our ideas and our liberation. What happens in Gaza has no concern to us. In fact, the only thing we should be worried about in Gaza is how the black uh, Palestinians in the in uh, in Gaza and in the West Bank are treated. That's the only thing we should be worried about. Get them out. We should be airlifting them out. All right. So the enemy within. Ethiopia has a long history of using a clandestine security apparatus to quell dissent. Ezekiel Gabisa, professor of history and African studies at Kettering University in the United States, told Reuters. During Haile Selassie's four-decade rule last century, the emperor created a network of spies known colloquially as the Joro Tabi, or listeners, to hunt his opponents. The communist Derg military junta that toppled Selassie in 1974 set up a vast new security system to eliminate eliminate threats to the regime. At the turn of the century, Ethiopia got a new constitution and parliament. But this government, too, led by Meles Zenawi, uh, Zenawi grew increasingly repressive and fashioned a top-down structure of surveillance that extended to every level of society. The system was commonly known as Amist Leand, uh, one to five, because spies were typically assigned five people to monitor. Abi uh, became prime minister in 2018. According to the current and former government officials, the Kori Naginya Security Committee was formed soon afterwards in response to youth protests in Aromia over inequality and economic mismanagement. The Kori Naginya sits down and decides that a person needs to be detained. Then they go and arrest them without warrant or investigation or due process. A former judge on the Aromia Supreme Court. Melkisa Gemechu, the former member of the Prosperity Party Central Committee, said he first heard of the Kori Naginya at a meeting of Oromo political leaders in March 2019. There, Shimelis, newly appointed as president of Aromia, announced that the Kori Naginya would directly would direct operations against enemy elements and enemy cells, said Mil Kessa. Shemelis and Abi's office didn't respond to questions about the Kori Naginya. Reuters couldn't independently verify Mil Kessa's accounts of the meeting. Mil Kessa now lives in the United States. He says he left Ethiopia after receiving threats from security officials for criticizing Abi uh, and the Prosperity Party, including over their handling of unrest in Aromia. From late 2019, the Kori Naginya met in the Prosperity Party's Romia regional headquarters in downtown Addis Ababa as often as three times a week, said the two officials who participated in some of the meetings. The buildings was emptied. The building was emptied of other staff. Attendees handed in their phones, and the documents were collected at the end of each session. These people said, "Abi's father is a Romo, and he owes his premiership in part to youth-led protests in Romia that forced his predecessor Hali Mariam uh, Desalain." Uh, to resign. Nevertheless, unrest in the region quickly loomed as a major challenge for the new prime minister. Very interesting. So Abi Ahmed came to power through sort of that same energy and discontent that is in the region that he is now suppressing. It's very interesting, very fascinating. So he is a Romo, but now he is the leader of the country and trying to suppress the Romo region, Aromia, from having its own independence and freedom. You know, I don't know. That's very fascinating to me. Uh, Ever since Emperor Menelik II's campaign of conquest at the close of the 19th century imposed Amhara culture and language on assimilated groups, Oromos have complained of political and social marginalization. Oromos hoped their lots would improve with Abi, but many became disenchanted when change didn't materialize. New protests broke out in October 2019, and the Kori Naginya cracked down. On a in a Romo Thanksgiving festival in Addis Ababa in October 2023, the Romos have complained of marginalization since the late 19th century. So if I understand this right, in Ethiopia, about 300 years ago, there was a king, Emperor Menelik. He conquered all of what is today Ethiopia. And because he was Amharic, he won. He dominated the rest of the people and said, y'all have to speak our language, follow our customs, and that sort of stuff. And ever since then, the other ethnic groups in Ethiopia have been pissed. <laughs> They've been hella pissed. <laughs> they like, the other ethnic groups in Ethiopia are like, we don't even like injera. 
<laughs> that's crazy. And since then, everybody's been mad. Okay, so that's why Ethiopia is sort of divided. All right, I can understand where this animosity comes from. I can get that. But can we can we put this to the side finally? Because we got a bigger we got bigger fish to fry. And I know this is hard for the Africans to understand because many of the Africans don't know white people. They don't know how they view us. They don't know how they treat us. And it's very hard to see how neocolonialism still rapes Africa of all of its resources and minerals and wealth. But guys, when I look at this crowd, when I look at this crowd here, y'all tell me who's a Romo. Y'all tell me who's Amhara. Y'all tell me who's Somali. Y'all tell me who's, uh, what is it, Sidama. When y'all look at this crowd, do y'all see that? I know this might seem basic for me to say, oh, uh, let's all unify around skin color. But when we have a common enemy who is unified against us because of our skin color or because of our heritage, what else are we to do except unify around that? I know this sounds simplistic, but what we're facing is very uh, uh, diametric in the battlefield, if that makes sense. So, uh it might be easy to answer because it says in the subtext here, an Aromo Thanksgiving festival in Addis Ababa. But without the byline, <laughs> without the caption, I, it will be hard to tell. Continuing here. Uh, when a prominent Aromo singer, Hakalu uh, Hundisa, uh, was killed in June 2020 in an attack the government blamed on Aromo rebels, clashes between protesters and police led to at least 200 civilian deaths and 5,000 arrests, human rights groups have said. Aromia President Shemelis and Regional Prosperity Party head Fekadu pres presided over a series of Skype calls with each of the 19 big cities and 21 zones of the region at the time. Uh, according According to the two people who participated in some meetings of the Kori Naginya. Shemelis and Fakadu ordered some protesters arrested and others killed, the two people said. According to one of these people, Shemelis told one zonal administrator to have his forces shoot protesters if the demonstrations got out of hand. The sources did not specify numbers of people to be arrested or killed. Absolutely horrible. Mm, 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 mm. A tribal massacre. A former advisor to Shemelis told Reuters that in important cases, like prominent executions, orders come from Shemelis or Ararsa, Aromia's police uh, commissioner, until his promotion last year to head of security. One such case, the sources said, was a massacre in early December 2021 of 14 tribesmen. Uh, the killings were reported at the time in Ethiopia, but the blame for the crime has been a matter of dispute. Reuters reviewed previously unreported official accounts of the incident and spoke to a local official who said he witnessed key moments leading up to the slaughter. On November 30th, 2021, suspected uh, OLA fighters killed 11 police officers and wounded 17 in an ambush in Fentale, a rural district of Aromia that lies in the Great Rift Valley. So the OLA is like the fighters for the Aromo people. They're killing police. So of course the government is going to clap back. But should we But should we be doing this? Should we be doing this? This is the question. Y'all tell me if I'm tripping. Y'all tell me if I'm tripping. Should this be happening in Africa amongst our people? Should people that look like us, who are all oppressed, who are all poor, who are all getting exploited by these Western colonial powers, should we be pointing our guns at each other and slaughtering each other over different languages, different cultures, different borders? Should we be doing that or should we be unifying? unifying around our blackness, unifying around our shared goals of liberation for Africa? Shouldn't we be doing that? Or should we be having secret police? like the Kori Naginya. I don't know. Y'all tell me. Uh, should we be talking about Gaza when we have stories like this happening? Y'all tell me. Where am I wrong? All right. Then Police Commissioner Ararsa and the region's Deputy President Awalu Abdi arrived at the district administration's compound the following day, the local official said. Like Ararsa, Awalu is a member of the Kori Naginya, according to five sources. Also present was then local zonal administrator Ababu Wako. The local official recounted that Ababu received a phone call from a military commander whose troops had detained uh, 16 suspected rebels in a forest area near the shallow, shallow waters of Lake Pasak. The commander was seeking guidance about what to do with the suspects. The local official said he was present when Ababu took the phone call and heard the discussions that followed. Ababu consulted his more senior visitors. Ararsa and Awalu said the men should be killed, the local official said. And Ababu passed on the command. Don't spare anyone. Shoot them all. Two other sources independently corroborated this account. Both said they were briefed on the events by people who were present. Awalu, Ararsa, and Ababu did not respond to requests for comment about the killings. Jump into the comments here. Nelson Morano says, once Africans embrace a transcending identity of African, they will reach the stars. A new age would be born. I think we do 
a lot of, you know, during my trips to Africa, when you go to places like Kenya or Tanzania, they say, welcome to Africa. They don't say welcome to Tanzania. They don't say welcome to Kenya. They say, you know, welcome to Africa, brother, right? Stuff like that. And then they try to rip you off for $20 when you're buying the water or something like that. But that's the thing. There is some sort of general idea of Africa as a bigger force than just the nations within it. But nationalism still exists. And also ethnic tension comes into it, like what we see in South Africa, right? When you have Black people rallying against the Zimbabweans who are coming into the country illegally and stuff like that. And then they start saying the same sort of talking points we hear in the U.S. The Zimbabweans are bridging crime, they're drugs, they're rapists, and, so, and some, I assume, are good people, right? Some, something like that. But all of this has to stop. Anyway, going to jump to this brother right here who looks like uh, Earl Sweatshirt uh, in another lifetime. Uh, I don't know, how, how tough and thick is your afro that the rubber band don't even fold inside? Seriously, the rubber band don't even fold inside. That's a hard afro, bro. That's a lot of sheen. And that thing's shining, too. That thing's, I wish I had my hair. I'm just, I'm cracking jokes on this man because I ain't got no uh, scalp. My, sh my shit is barren. My shit barren like the Sahara. And that man is shining. So shout out to his fro. But seriously, how tough is it? How tough is it, man? Because the band ain't even going in the fro. <laughs> I'm tripping. All right. And a Roma man wears traditional costume at Aricha, a Thanksgiving celebration in Addis Ababa in 2019. Interesting. I would like to know the demographics of the city of Addis Ababa. Is it like a good mix of everybody or is it like dominated by Amhara people or Aroma people? I would like to know about the city of itself. Maybe it's a mix of everybody because maybe a lot of people go there to do business or get jobs. Anyway, this article is almost done and then we're going to close this live stream. So y'all get your questions out, comments out, anything y'all want to say. So a phone call. The call to local administrator Ababu had come from military commander Gizachu Makuria uh, operating in the Seca forest. As he spoke, the 16 detained Aroma men looked on according to two surviving witnesses who say they heard Gizachu make the call. The detained men were not OLA members according to survivors, other witnesses, an Ethiopian Human Rights Commission report, and an investigation by the Oromia government. They were elders from Oromia's pastoralist Karayu tribe who were celebrating Jila, the arrival of a new season. The Oromia government investigation has not been previously reported. Reuters also reviewed details of the EHRC investigation that have not been made public. Wrapped in white traditional blankets with a machete hanging from one hip and a shepherd's stick from the other, the Oromo pastoralists had gathered that morning among a smattering of straw huts in the sandy village of Tututi to slaughter an ox, the witnesses said. Around 11.30 a.m., dozens of armed men in military fatigues arrived in the village, according to five witnesses and the report by the EHRC. Uh, the fighters were members of the Aromia Regional Security Forces and allied militiamen. Such regional forces form part of Ethiopia's federal security apparatus. At first, the armed men assured the elders they wanted to talk. The witnesses said the tribe's religious leader, Kadiro Hawas Baru, told the elders to cooperate. But the atmosphere soon deteriorated. The soldiers rounded up the tribesmen who were standing under the traditional black, red, and white flag of the Aroma people, two of the witnesses said. The soldiers started to insult the Karayu and accuse them of being members of Shane, local slang for the OLA. They went on to beat women and children and looted several houses, taking money, clothes, and soap, the five witnesses said. The soldiers then marched 38 men and a 10-year-old boy to an asphalt road nearby. There they interrogated their captives for over five hours and badly beat some of them. Gizachu led the interrogations. At one point, he slapped the Karayu leader, Kadiro, and accused him of being an OLA member. The two survivors said, you are dying first. You are Shane, one of the survivors, Boru Mieso, recalled Gizachu telling Kadiro. Reuters interviewed Boru in, in May 2022. The second survivor corroborated Boru's account. Gizachu did not respond to a request for comment. After the questioning was over, the men were split into two groups, one containing 16 men, including Kadiro, and another of 23 captives. The first group was driven to the nearby Seca forest, while the rest were taken to jail. When Kadiro arrived at the forest, he begged Gizachu to kill them all to end the beatings and humiliation. Finish us, please, he said, according to Boru and the other survivors, who asked to remain anonymous. Gizachu then made his phone call. 
man, there should be a there should be a movie made about this. You know, there are so many stories happening in Africa right now that are so heartbreaking, but also so uh, moving and touching and also thought provoking that, you know, cinema should really be looking at this. I know in a few years we're going to have a bunch of stories coming out about the horrors and tragedies of what happened and what's happening in Rafa and the and the Southern Crossing and what's happening in Gaza or the West Bank. But we really need some stories about what's happening in Africa, what's happening in Sudan what's happening in Ghana, what's happening in Ethiopia, all these places, because these stories are absolutely heartbreaking, but also uh, uh, such learning experiences. We can learn a lot from that. Remember when Hotel Rwanda came out? When the movie Hotel Rwanda came out, it was a cultural force. It was a movie everybody could not stop talking about. And it taught us a lot of lessons about how hatred can uh, come out from rhetoric, rhetoric, how it can make people despise people that look just like them, and what we can learn from that, right? So there should be stories made from this too, just like Hotel Rwanda. I might be tripping, but y'all let me know what y'all think. All right, blame it on the OLA. After Gazachu received his orders, uh, 14 of the men, Kadiro among them, were gunned down at point blank range. The bodies were left to rot and were eaten by wild animals, according to survivors and villagers who later recovered and buried the dead. Baru and the second survivor said they managed to escape by scrambling into a ditch to dodge a hail of bullets. Word of the killing spread quickly. Aromia's regional government blamed the OLA. Two senior prosperity party lawmakers from the region disputed that narrative and in Facebook posts accused police commissioner Ararsa of being responsible. One of the lawmakers is now in jail, accused of conspiring to overthrow the government, which he denies. An investigation by the EHRC blamed security forces for the killings. It did not specify which forces or name the alleged perpetrators. Two EHRC sources familiar with the case told Reuters that local residents and witnesses said high-ranking officials gave the order to kill. Nine local officials and police officers, including Gazachu, were arrested, but none were charged. In September 2022, they were all released, four local government officials said. Bodies of slain elders from the Karayu tribe await burial in a village of Tututi, Aromia, and 2021. This is absolutely horrible. No black person should be treated like this, and we should not treat each other like this at all over stupid things like this. Um, Rwandan genocide was around this date. Uh, I don't know exactly what date you're talking about, but if you're talking about uh, uh, 2021, I think it happened way before that. That was in the 90s. But if you're talking about the specific month that the Rwandan genocide happened, I'm not sure. It's hard to look at these pictures knowing that these men were probably innocent, just trying to take care of their families, and then they got caught up in the crossfire of a senseless conflict that's happening between two different ethnic groups of people. Uh, peace to Ethiopia. Peace to Ethiopia. All right, Prime Minister Abi was briefed twice about the killings by an official and by Karayu leader, elders, uh, according to people who were present. Reuters spoke to one person who witnessed the briefing by the official and five who attended the meeting with the tribal elders. In early 2022, the Aromia government launched its own investigation. The inquiry resulted in a 10 and a Walu were questioned by Aromia government investigators. According to the report, they confirmed they were present in the area that day, but they denied ordering that the tribesmen be killed. Awalu said that said he told the regional government's communications office to blame the OLA. According to the report, Awalu recalled saying, no matter who did the killing, let's just blame it on the OLA and put out the statement accordingly. In October 2022, massacre survivor Boru was walking his cattle near the spot where the slain tribesmen were buried. Like most men of the Karayu, he was carrying a gun. According to two witnesses, members of the Aromia security forces pulled up in a pickup truck alongside Boru, confiscated his gun, and then beat him. Moments later, they shot him dead, the witnesses said. Security officials did not respond to a request for comment. Wow. Murdered Karayu elders are buried in the village of Tututi, Aromia. Very uh, sad to see. It looks like they do uh, mausoleums here. They don't bury their dead underground. They put them overground. And I wonder if they're Muslim, because I see the uh, star, the moon, and the crescent. The moon and the crescent moon. The crescent moon and the star, sorry. All right. The name of the dead Karayu elders are listed on the grave. Here are the people here. Murder their elders, man. That's that's the worst thing, man. We're murdering young people, and especially the elders, too, because the elders, they can't fight nobody. They don't want to hurt nobody. They just want to, you know, talk story. They just want to talk stories and play checkers. I just want to tell old stories, smoke tobacco, and play checkers. Anyway, continuing here. 
Arrest and detentions. The Kori Naginya not only eliminates suspected enemies, it also acts preemptively to keep protesters off the streets. In 2019, the committee started to order that people it deemed a threat to security be arrested or have their prison terms prolonged, according to half a dozen judges and prosecutors who worked on such cases. One of the sources, an intelligence official, shared in an internal document listing more than 1,006 names of men and women arrested on the committee's orders between 2019 and March 2022. The document lists full names, gender, and location of arrest. The Corey Naginya sits down and decides that a person needs to be detained, said a former judge on the Aromia Supreme Court. Then they go and arrest them without warrant or investigation or due process. Prisoners under the authority of the committee are referred to by the police and other security agents as Hala Yero, meaning those jailed because of the current security situation. According to a dozen prisoners, five judicial sources, and the two EHRC sources, all spoke on condition of anonymity because of the sensitivity of the matter. All right. Now, Nelson Moreno says extreme hatred on their hearts. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we need to try to fight a way, find a way to, you know, fight against this hatred, you know, for black people of different stripes and different ethnic groups and stuff like that. Like no matter where you are in the world, we have to realize all black life is sacred. All black life is sacred because the world is against us. The world is against our lives, our expressions. Us uh, being here in and of itself is radical in and of itself. And taking a black life is one of the biggest sins you could do as a black person because we should be protecting each other. We should be protecting each other above all else because of the uh, the hatred that exists against us in this world. And how sincerely and sincerely, and you will not know this. You will not know this until you start traveling, until you start seeing seeing the vitriol that exists in the eyes and hearts and, and the tongues on the tip of their lips of other people across the world, how they think about black people, how they talk about black people, how they disregard uh, instances of white supremacy and racism that is that that uh, shows up and appears right in front of our faces. You will not know this until you start traveling and talking to them crackers. When you start talking to them crackers, you'll realize, you'll realize we have to protect each other. I'm serious. Uh, so uh, Rada said, yo, just hopped in here. Shout out to Rada. Uh, don't know where you are. Don't know who you are, but shout out to you. Join the chat. Have any comments or questions? We're talking about what's happening in Ethiopia, taking a break from talking about Gaza because I'm sick and tired of hearing about black people crashing out for another group of people's problems when we got issues of our own that need to be discussed. Nelson Moreno says, uh, uh, did you see the girl who just who plays Juliet in a theater play with Tom Holland? She's receiving Olympic amounts of racism. Um, I don't know exactly what you're talking about. The girl who plays Juliet in theater play with Tom Holland. Uh, no. Are you talking about Romeo and Juliet? They remade Romeo and Juliet and Tom Holland is Romeo. And I guess they got Zendaya to, ble to play Juliet. <laughs> <laughs> Zendaya is the only actress right now who can kiss a white man and make it seem believable. <laughs> I can't see <laughs> who can kiss a white man right now and make it seem believable. Nobody. Nobody. <laughs> Am I tripping? It's only Zendaya who can like really put lips on Tom Holland or any other, you know, uh, Caucasian man and make it seem real. Uh <laughs> Can you see Taraji P. Henson putting lips on a white boy and make, and believing it? I, I can't see it. I can't see it. I don't know. I might be tripping. I might be tripping. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know who's the black girl you're talking about who played Juliet. Let us know, Nelson. Put it in the chat. <laughs> Anyway, uh, their cases are handled by the police who have repeatedly defied court orders that they be released, according to the sources. And the detainees are jailed in separate facilities, mostly military barracks and training camps, without access to family members or the courts, they said. Uh, in 2021, report by the EHRC, based on interviews with 281 detainees across 21 police stations in Oromia, names the Kori Naginya as interfering in the legal process involving people suspected of having links to armed groups. So for anybody who's tuning in early or tuning in late, sorry, uh, the, the Kori Naginya are like the secret police of Ethiopia. They're uh, attacking protesters, uh, killing innocent people like elders in uh, remote regions who are just cattle herders and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, they're also like locking up people who are conspiring against the government. Uh, the point of my live stream and the point I'm trying to make here is that these sorts of repressive uh, government institutions or police forces should be abolished on the uh, continent of Africa. There is no good reason for any African leader, any black leader to be a Pressing black life to this degree. No matter what the purpose is, no matter what the purpose is, we should not be doing this to our people. 
period. Um, continuing here, uh, their case, their cases were not handled by courts of law, but rather by what is called the Security Council, the report said. This Security Council was established under the regional administration bodies and has a mandate to investigate and decide on their cases. So judges and lawyers who resist interference from government officials have faced intimidation, assault, kidnapping, and one attempted murder of a court president, according to an earlier May 2019 report by the Aromia Supreme Court seen by Reuters that was shared with Aromia's regional president, his deputy, and the police commissioner. A Supreme Court judge told Reuters that two to four judges approached him each week to complain about interference in the justice system. I used to believe in the reform agenda of Abi. I really wanted to be a part of the transition, the judge said. At first, I justified the behavior of the security forces and thought it was linked to a particular moment. But at some point, I realized the problem was systemic. Everyone who disagreed with the Kori Naginia would be removed. I find this very interesting that it sounds like the Ethiopian government is sort of like cannibalizing itself. Once again, Ethiopia has sort of like a federal confederation sort of system. So Aromia is like its sort of own independent nation that chooses to be a part of the larger Ethiopian. Ethiopian confederation, right? But the Kori Naginya and the federal government of Ethiopia is like having their security forces threaten the judges and stuff like that. Like, think about that. That would be like comparable to like in the United States, the Secret Service threatens to assassinate the Supreme Court judges of Louisiana because they want to, I don't know, uh, ban abortion in Louisiana or something like that, right? Like, that's crazy to think about. But in Ethiopia, that's sort of happening. And you know what? This sort of makes me think about the bigger issue of like systems of government. Could a confederation based on ethnic lines ever truly hold together? I mean, I think somewhat to some degree, um, it depends, right? Because the, the European Union is sort of hanging on by a thread. And this is a conglomeration of many different uh, groups of people, some who have even had beef in the past uh, existing together in one union. So yeah, I do think it is possible. And as a globalist, an unashamed globalist, I actually do think it's possible. But is it also dependent on a certain level of development? Is it also dependent on a certain level of understanding, right? Because the Europeans sort of hold it together because they went through centuries of cannibalizing each other, killing each other, gassing each other, uh, committing genocide against each other. <laughs> they went through all of that and say, oh, you know what, guys? We can actually dominate and do all that evil stuff to the rest of the world's people. Let's not do it to each other, right? So that's the sort of understanding that they have to keep the European Union together, right? And also Russia in and of itself is the one, uh, the last bastion of white folks that won't get on the same page as the rest of the white folks, right? But in Africa, there's no sort of like shared history like that. Yes, there have been international conflicts and stuff like that, like Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of the Congo have been going at it. Uh, and uh, there have been civil wars, countless civil wars throughout different nations in Africa. But there is no understanding that confederations, unionism, um, Federalism uh, can uh, stop conflicts and it's better to work together. There is no sort of like that moment hasn't clicked yet in African history. And I wonder when it will happen. I wonder, will it take a large uh, global or international African conflict to bring that uh, to be? I don't I don't know. I hope not. I hope we could just easily get on the same page. But then again, hey, what what do I know? I'm just some guy online going to jump into the comments uh, here. So uh, Nelson Moreno says, yeah, that's it. But she isn't a pretty biracial girl. Her name is Francesca Rivers. Insane amounts of racism only online. Francesca Rivers. I haven't heard of her. Uh, Y'all let me know what she played in. All right. Um, that's funny. Uh, <laughs> she isn't pretty. I don't know if you're saying Zendaya isn't pretty or, Fran or Francesca isn't pretty. Because I think Zendaya is like, Zendaya is a six. Zendaya is a six. In Louisiana, she's like a nine. But that's because she weighs under like 170 pounds. Like anywhere else, Zendaya is just like a six, low key. She's only like good when she like, you know, dresses up. I'm keeping it in a butt. I don't know about Francesca Rivers. All right. Rada says, I must ask, when it comes to protecting Ethiopia, what powers do we really have? As an American, I'd hardly say I have my own ish together. Unless we force a federal par uh, paradigm shift, how can we change this? All right. That's a very good question. I like Rada for saying that question. OK, uh, no, you have a good point there, really. All right. No, no, I understand what uh, Rada is saying. Listen, guys, I'm just one man with an opinion. Some people might say, what's the point of doing anything? We don't have any power. I think all of us do have a power by using our voices, using our minds, using how we're going to spend our money. You know, uh, individually, we are powerless. 
but what makes us useful as people, what allows people to affect change is when people unify around certain goals and causes, right? The whole world right now, individual people who are powerless are unifying together to try to put pressure on the United States government and the rest of the world's government to make Israel stop its genocidal campaign against the Gazan people, right? If enough people were out here speaking out against what's happening in Sudan, where the Arabs are trying to ethnically eliminate the black Mosalite tribe, if enough black people were out here speaking out about what is happening in Ethiopia, where they are slaughtering people that look like them just because of ethnic or religious or cultural differences, if enough of us were speaking out against this individual powerless people can affect powerful change. I don't think we should ever throw our hands up in the air and say, well, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. Let's forget about it. Listen, we we all know that we cannot change the world, but we have to all try to do something to make this world a better place. I wholeheartedly believe that because if you don't believe that you can do something to actually change the world, we all might as well just kill ourselves. We all might as well just jump off a bridge. We all might as well just give up on life. We all might as well just drink till we pass out and die or smoke our lives away. We should just do that instead of actually trying to do something that creates better, better uh, things that we want to see in the world. Right. And I'm just doing my small part. I was God blessed me to have a voice, to have a determination and to be crazy uh, enough to not care what people think about me, that I started this YouTube channel and I started talking and I talked and talked and talked until I got 3000 subscri subscribers. I still got only four people in the live stream chat, but I feel like I'm making progress and I'm going to continue to try to do what I do to advocate for the causes I believe in, to speak out uh, against issues that I think are important for our people, to try to do something. And hopefully Rada, hopefully Nelson Moreno, hopefully everybody who's listening to my voice right now, now or in the future, will do the same thing. Because I don't want any black person living in this world uh, thinking like, you know, our lives don't matter. The white supremacists tell us that our lives don't matter. The white supremacists tell us that we're ugly, that we're ghetto, that we're stupid, that all we do is play basketball and listen to hip hop and let our dicks hang to the floor. That's not what God created us as black people to be on this planet. We were meant to live our full lives and be great people. And I hope you do that too. Right. Raider, whoever you are. OK. Uh, that's all I got to say. But that's a very good point. I like that. I like that. Uh, continuing here because we're almost done with this article. And then we're going to hop on X. So jump on X if you want to chat it up with uh, the people here. Money Music, Money Muscle jumped into the comments. He said, yep, keep going, bro. Black Power Fist. All right. Power to the people. Power to you. Good, sir. All right. Uh, two gym instructors told Reuters they were detained in 2021 on suspicion of working with the OLA and subjected to a torture method known as number eight, a reference to how prisoners are suspended from the ceiling with their arms bound together at the wrist and their legs bound together at the ankle. Both men deny any involvement with the OLA. I was put upside down and then electrocuted on the sole of my foot, one said, showing scars from the electrodes on his feet and fingers. Five days a week for 45 Five days. My God. Oh, my God. Uh, when they torture you using this method, blood spills out of your body, said the other. Ethiopian authorities did not respond to requests for comment about the accounts of torture. The two men told Reuters they were released after several months in prison. Others have spent years behind bars with no prospect of freedom, their lawyers and families said. And that's the end of the article. I want to say shout out to Julia Pavaracini for writing this. It was edited by Aaron Ross and Janet McBride, written for Reuters. The link is in the description of this video. And once again, I have to say, I have to say this. I have to say this. Situations like this, we should not want to see for our people anywhere, anywhere. I know everybody is upset about what's happening in Gaza. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. We can't go five seconds without turning on the news and hearing about what's happening in Gaza. And that's why a lot of people are choosing to tune it out and pay attention to Kendrick versus Drake or whatever is happening with Diddy because we want distractions away from the horrific things that are happening on this planet. And listen, there is a time and place to be entertained. There is a time and place to just numb out with your brain. Trust me, after I finish this live stream, usually I just eat something very sweet and watch something very stupid on YouTube. But we should never, never try to blind our eyes to what is really happening in the world, to people that look like us no matter where we are in the world. Some people might say, there's nothing we can do. You can find a charity that you can donate to to help Ethiopians or other black people on the continent. You can donate your time. You can donate your voice. You can write. You can speak. You can make art. You can do something to speak up for our people, which we should always try to do, right? Let's not just drown our lives away with entertainment, music, and BS. Let's actually try to use something, do something for our people here. And let's always remember 
let's always remember here that uh, at the end of the day, we are a very special people. We're the melanated people. We're the aboriginal people of the planet Earth. And uh, Ethiopia has a very long history. It's one of the uh, oldest inhabited places on the planet Earth. It was one of few African nations that was not fully colonized. It was, uh, it's a place that has a lot of uh, deep history, right? One of the oldest Christian kingdoms in the world. Uh, one of the few African nations that uses a... Uh, African indigenous written script to uh, tell its story and to speak. So it is a beautiful place full of beautiful people. And I can't wait to travel to Ethiopia one day, but I will always speak up for our people, no matter where they are. What the Ethiopian government is doing to its people is absolutely wrong and horrendous, and it needs to be spoken out against. Period. Period. Stop those secret police killings. Stop the secret police detentions. Let's let black people live free. Let's have democracy for black people, freedom of speech for black people, and able and uh, the, the opportunity for black people to live full and happy lives. Going to read this last comment from Nelson Moreno, then I'm going to shut this off. We have to remember that this world isn't evil or good. It's indifferent. It's people who harm us, even the ones who share our suffering. That's a very deep comment. I'll leave it at that. Shout out to Nelson Moreno. Shout out to Money Muscle. Shout out to Rada. Shout out to Acti, my beautiful wife. Shout out to Backpack Bandits. Go subscribe to that channel. Shout out to Rod Mann. And my name is Simon Hill. Catch you on the next live stream.